Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining our call and our video. Uh, I'm Ivo Dollar, the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us via Zoom. Uh, because of the situation around the country uh, and around the world, and so we can live uh, up to the CDC guidelines, the council has made the decision to cancel all of our in-person public events through at least June 5th. Uh, as an institution, we're as committed as ever to being the organization in Chicago that brings you relevant and timely conversations on what is happening in the world and why it matters even if those conversations have to take place virtually for now. But we're glad to have a large online audience who can join us for these and future events. Please check our website and social media pages for updates, as well as for new podcasts, new events, new blogs, and our research, which continues to be available uh, through our digital uh, engagement. Thank you to our members who are now turning in. And right now we need your support and engagement more than ever. Please do keep us in mind as you help to keep nonprofits operating in this very challenging time. Now on to our main topic for today. As the global responses to COVID-19 pandemic continue to evolve, we recognize that the effects of this virus are first and foremost a humanitarian issue. That said, its effects have also cut across many aspects of international trade, including supply chain management, business travel, manufacturing, and sales. Really, the entire global economy is grinding to a halt. There has been coordination among industry, and central banks, and, uh, and in national economies, uh, but the future is as uncertain as ever. We'll use the next 45 minutes to discuss these and other issues. Uh, we'll open up, our, uh, as always, uh, to your questions, which you can submit by opening up your browser and type in ccga.live where you can submit a question or vote for the questions that you'd like us to address. Today, I'm pleased to welcome a good friend of the council, Phil Levy. Uh, Phil serves currently as the chief economist for Flexport, a fast rising freight forwarding company based in San Francisco. Previously, he served as a senior economist for trade for President George W. Bush's Council on Economic Advisors. And he was a senior fellow of the global economy here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Phil has been highly sought after to share his insights and analysis of the rap rapidly shifting world of trade policy, and he is joining us uh, today to share his views. Uh, Phil, thanks much for joining. Uh, I believe it's an incredibly busy time for you, so we're, we're really grateful for you to, um, to, give, uh, to share 45 minutes of that time with us. It's very good to be with you. Uh, you've been a practicing economist for decades uh, now. Uh, if you look at the current economic situation, the crisis that we have, where would you rank this among the challenges of previous instances of crisis uh, that you have either seen or studied in the past? I think it's certainly the same order of magnitude as the global financial crisis. It's qualitatively different. This is actually what a lot of economists have been scrambling to do now, that there's this real appetite for forecasts for what, what does this mean? How much will GDP drop and for how long? And so you go searching back and you say, where have we had a disaster like this? Something where we can model off of that. And the things that people keep looking at are, you have the Fukushima um, the tsunami situation, earthquake and tsunami in Japan in 2011. You had the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008. You had the SARS episode in around 2003. None of them is a particularly good fit. Um, and part of that is what we see now, which is that once things, um, you know, those, the, the tsunami as horrible as it was, then it was done and you had to sort of do cleanup and get over it, but everyone could move around and do that. Here we get this shock sort of rolling across. I'm hesitant to say whether it's above or whether it's in front of or behind the global financial crisis. That depends heavily on how long this lasts. But I think it's that order of magnitude. Yeah, that's this uncertainty, really, not only about uh, where we are today, but where are we going to be a week from now? Where are we going to be two weeks and three weeks from now? We really don't know because this virus, of course, is a living organism. It keeps spreading, which makes it uh, so difficult to predict. It's not a one instant affair. It's uh, really a roller coaster that we're living under. Uh, so as you, as you 
watched this all unfold. And in your business, tracking supply chains, uh, the impact was pretty uh, noticeable because you're, you're a data guy. Uh, but but when, when was it that you realized, what was the moment that this was going to be this bad, uh, uh, at least as, as bad as we now think it is? I think as soon as things sort of broke free of China, that it, you knew it was going to be sort of very bad as just a China problem. If you have the world's second biggest economy and they get taken offline for a while, but to the extent that they're taken offline, you hope that's for a finite period, they come back online and we are seeing signs of China coming back online. And if the rest of the world hasn't been, it hasn't been stopped in the meantime, things might be okay. As you realized that you were going to start to have a coordinated global shutdown, it was pretty clear that was bad news. So let's talk a little bit about China. Let's talk about some of the uh, the specifics here. China, of course, was the first one, as you as you said. Uh, what what have you observed on how they managed to the shut down? Uh, what uh, how did you see that happening, and what what impact do you think it's had up to this point? And how quickly do you think uh, they might be recovering? Uh, as, as they look ahead where we are today and sort of over the next few months, how quickly do you think they're back online? How do you see this evolving? Yeah. So with the China case, of course, this is where it started. It started um, uh, in, in Wuhan and in, in Hubei province. And it took China a little while to get going on this, but then they did some very dramatic public health measures, um, including you know, real serious lockdowns um, in sort of an unprecedented fashion where you were quarantining 40, 50 million people. Um, that seems from the data to have been fairly effective in stopping new infections coming in China. In terms of trying to interpret what that meant for them economically, and as you said at the beginning, it's the humanitarian thing that's the most important, but also turning to the economics. Um, it, the, the whole picture was a little bit muddled because of the traditional shutdown that they have with Chinese New Year that this, if you watch things, I mean, it's true for, as you know very well, it's true for factories and things there, but also shipping. Every year, you see an enormous drop off in activity right around Chinese New Year. That is the spring festival, there's a tradition of people going home, um, and massive migrations across China. And so it always comes to a near stop. The question then is, how quickly do you recover from that stop? Um, we've got some, I got some national data I can share with you, and then I've got some Flexport data that I can share with you. Great. The national data we just got earlier this week, which is because Chinese New Year moves around, it's always quick, difficult to do year over year things because sometimes it's in January, sometimes it's in February. Um, so the Chinese put out data for January and February jointly. The stuff that they put out at the beginning of this week was shockingly bad. Because figures like industrial production. When I say shockingly bad, of course, everybody knew it wasn't going to be good data, but you would have consensus estimates of something like industrial production being down 3% year over year. And remember, this is for all of China. This is not just Hubei province. Instead, they were like negative 13.5%, if I remember correctly, give or take a little. And so dramatically worse than what informed estimates had been. Um, what we are seeing in shipment data, since we move a lot of uh, a lot of goods through both air and ocean traffic on that route, there has been a recovery that normally the slowest week is the week after Chinese New Year. This year, it kept going down. Shipments kept going down. They've rebounded, but they have not rebounded as much as we normally see. So if you look at, as of March 10th last week, our data showed that it's, the shipments are 13% up on the week before. So that's a 13% increase, and it's up by, you know, whatever, uh, uh, let's see, about 100% over what had been the week after Chinese New Year. But, the, but normally, you would have rebounded something like 300%. So it, you're seeing recovery, but it's a slow, gradual recovery. And unfortunately, they're going to get to a point where now that they're ready to ship the goods, it calls into question whether, whether everybody else is ready to receive them. Yeah, because of course the the, the two big other markets uh, that the Chinese have, the United States and, and Europe, uh, are in the process of shutting down themselves, or in fact are are virtually shutting down. Before before we get to the U.S., yeah. um, uh, just some other parts of the world, uh, p countries really hard hit. Italy uh, and Italy's been sort of shut down for now two plus weeks. Spain just uh, recently. 
Um, any, uh, uh, what, what do you see happening there? Uh, are there other economies that you're, uh, are looking at that you're worried that they, in fact, might not be able to weather the storm? It looks like China may be able to come back. Uh, how, uh, how big is the impact on, on slightly uh, less stable economies that walked into the crisis already with, uh, with a problem? Uh, I'd add Brazil, perhaps, uh, uh, to, that, uh, to that list. How do you see those economies both weathering a storm today and, and what do you think is likely uh, even once uh, the disease uh, is uh, under some form of control? Yeah, so good question. I think as we sort of tour around the world a little bit, you look at China's neighbors, um, you had serious outbreaks in South Korea and Japan, both major players. They took fairly drastic action and seemed to have things reasonably well under control. Um, if you turn to Europe, I don't think you can say that. I think Europe, um, especially Italy, Italy is sort of the worst case scenario, it seems, simply measured by how many deaths they've had, you know, per population. Um, and even just in, in absolute numbers, um, Italy looks like a very dire situation, but you are also seeing shutdowns in France, in Germany, as you said, in Spain. But it's, it's worth remembering that you have, you know, these are some of the top economies in the world. When we talk about Italy, France, Germany, that's three of like the top eight or so of global economies. And so then you add in US, China, Japan, you're really hitting a lot of the sort of economic engine that drives things. And one of the points here, for all kinds of reasons, we really care about how the virus is proceeding and whether or not people are getting sick. It is from an economic standpoint, it is the response that can do the most damage. Um, that's not to say the response is wrong. This may be an absolutely necessary thing to do, but if you wanted to talk about how to do sort of the most damage to an economy, coming up with a coordinated shutdown is, is a pretty good way to do it. And, and then the problem that what sort of led us into this is as, you know, as, a, as a country like China is trying to revive and come online, where do they ship the goods and are they able to get them into places? So I'm not going to ask you to make a prediction about where the global economy uh, uh, numbers are going to be, other than I think we all agree it's, it's going to be grim uh, for, uh, for quite a while. Uh, the last time we had, as, as we talked about, a really big global financial crisis was the, was the financial crisis back in 08, 09. And what was interesting at that time, uh, world leaders were, were quickly able to come together and created the G20, in fact, out of that uh, uh, crisis in order to coordinate common policies and try to battle the, the, the problem together. Um, doesn't look like we've had the same kind of coordination uh, across nations, not even uh, among the G7 nations. I think the G7 uh, banks only started talking uh, about a week ago. The leaders only only this week had a video conference. Uh, the president has canceled the G7 in-person meeting, though said he will have a number of uh, video conferences with his colleagues. Uh, how do you how do you see the the degree of economic uh, uh, coordination across the world and, and what's the, the price we're paying for the absence of it, or at least for the weakness of it? Uh, good question. I think that um, you, you see uh, cooperation coordination at multiple levels. So I think you sometimes see it at a business level. Um, you see it at a technocratic level, a sort of a more government policy experts, as you know very well. And then you see it at sort of a high political level. I don't think it's been very good at all at the high political level. Um, I think we are seeing more at the technocratic level. I think one of the things that has been very impressive in this is if you look at, for example, what the Federal Reserve has done, um, the impressive part was not the cutting of rates. That, that was fine and they did it, it was dramatic. These were two big emergency rate cuts. The impressive part is as they are dealing with the really relatively obscure plumbing that underlies the global financial system. And there, I think you are getting serious coordination among central banks. And you're also seeing it at the business level. So you have, uh, just to give you one example, I think earlier this week, um, Taiwan had declared that even pilots flying cargo flights into Taiwan were going to need to be, uh, be you know, quarantined for two weeks. Well, that immediately was going to sort of cut all cargo flights to Taiwan, you're getting revisions. And so sort of de facto things as people feel this out, almost the way we're seeing within the United States, de facto creation of policy often coming from the state or local level and then being more, more broadly adopted. So um, 
un- it's, it's difficult and, and has been, not been very good, I think, at the high political level, but at other levels we've seen more. I will come back to your, your point about what happens with the global economy. And no, I can't give you a number on this. But what I can give you and everyone joining us is things to watch for. And going into this, the, the optimists talked about a V-shaped recovery. So there were a lot of predictions that this was going to be very deep, but very short. So the, the V is what you're imagining on a graph, that the second quarter looks horrible, but you're actually getting a rebound in the third and fourth quarter that offsets that. That seems to be out the window now. I think that was largely predicated on a China interruption that didn't hit as much anywhere else. Now the real question that we're having is whether it's a U-shape or an L-shape. Um, and the, I think the key to that is going to be duration for how long this lasts and what happens to liquidity and the sort of the ability of businesses to stay as ongoing enterprises. And that's where duration maps into this is it's, it's very hard to bounce back if businesses have laid off all their workers and crumbled and then they're not there to bounce back. And in which case you have a much longer time trying to sort of restart and revive. That's what you're seeing in a lot of the packages that you're getting discussed in Congress and coming from the Fed is how do you provide liquidity? How do you try to keep this so that these are ongoing enterprises? So uh, just back to the graph, I mean, you have what you just described is the, is the beginning of an L graph, right? It's not coming back or it comes back very, very slowly. Yeah. Uh, even, even if you could figure out a way to make it a U-shaped uh, graph, a, a W, maybe, a, a U-shaped graph, the likelihood is we're going to see Ws, uh, which is to say until we have a vaccine and uh, therapeutics that really deal with the symptoms in a, in a, in a much more comprehensive way as we do, for example, with the flu, uh, we're more likely to see that as social distancing results in a reduction in a number of infections spreading, then you open up uh, the, the, the society as is now happening in China and that makes the society again vulnerable for a renewed spring of an in, in infection. Uh, have we ever had something, um, an, an, an outside force that that comes back over time that, and, and and really affects the economy, or is this some is this just terra incognita? Uh, you know, we just don't know what what we're what we're facing. Yes, yeah, so there's two things. I don't know that we've had one quite like that. Obviously, we've had wartime with ups and downs. Um, we have had pandemics before. Of course, there was 1918. It was one in the late 50s, late 60s. Um, but the economy was very different then, and the sort of likelihood of sort of passing around very different. The other thing which the these virologists remind us is that there's just a lot we don't know about how this behaves, and it's a bit of a moving target as we try to find out about it. That that you can sometimes get these viruses which evolve. A bit, and that's one of the reasons for the concern. That is this exactly the same in its behavior as it was two months ago, and will it be the same two months from now? Um, it, it, that's not a guarantee. So, it's I, I can't think of a good example going back. It's it's a very good question, and yes, you're right. W is also a concern. Yeah, just to to the, on the Spanish flu, as uh, which of course was the last really really terrible. Uh, pandemic to hit all of us, um, more people were killed in the second wave, significantly more people were killed in the second wave than in the first. Uh, and it was about a, a four or five month uh, lag in between those, those waves. So we're, we're, we're in for a, for a uncertain time. So uh, before I open it up and look at some of the questions that have been, are being submitted, and, and please continue to do so by, uh, for all of you who are listening, uh, go to your browser, type in ccga.com live uh, and uh, either vote for or uh, add your own questions. Uh, uh, and we'll get there in a minute, but I just want to spend one or two minutes talking about the U.S. economy. And, and, and I want to do it in terms of, of your, your new, uh, your new uh, position, thinking about supply chains. The, the reality of a United States economy interlinked with so much of the rest of the world at a time when, uh, uh, for for humanitarian and, and uh, reasons and health reasons, we're shutting down borders in a in a pretty fundamental way. In a way we really haven't seen since wartime. Uh, uh, we now uh, the U.S. has just announced, the President just announced this morning, an, an agreement with Mexico uh, uh, to coordinate uh, the border shutdown. We have one with 
uh, Canada. And of course, we have flight restrictions uh, continuing into Europe and, and parts of Asia. Um, what's the impact of that on, uh, on our economy, on the supply chains, on the ability to move uh, trade and goods, which are explicitly not included uh, in, uh, in, in the travel bans, but uh, in, in some ways are included. You mentioned the, the pilots who might be, uh, who have to be quarantines in Taiwan. That's one example of, of unintended consequences, but there, there are others. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm sort of reminded by our, our uh, global head of air freight, who actually is, is based in Chicago, that you know, the, one of the surprising things, we think about freight often moving by ocean or by air, um, an awful lot of air capacity to move things around is in the underbellies of passenger planes. Something like 50 to 80%, I think it's higher in the transatlantic than it was in the transpacific. But what that means is even if you try to be fairly selective, as you mentioned, with the government saying, we're not shutting down trade, we're just shutting down the movement of people, those two are intertwined when it comes to air freight. Now, it is also true that if you look in terms of the overall amount of goods that move around the world, air freight is something like 5% and ocean something like 95%. It's heavily tilted towards ocean. However, one of the things where air freight plays a really important role is if you've had an interruption in your supply chain and you are now having inventories that are starting to be depleted and you may not be able to continue production unless you get a key part, that's often when people would turn to air freight and say, I realize it's more expensive, air does cost more than ocean, but I need that part to keep going. So we'll use that as it becomes a much more of a key tool to replenish. And we, as noted, China has been largely offline for a couple of months, they're a key supplier. Now we're seeing other parts of the world that way. And at this moment, we're having real issues with air freight. Prices are soaring for air freight and capacity is dramatically down. And I should note, by the way, that capacity going down, this is not a government control measure, so it, but it's an indirect effect. So the, for the airlines, even though we've seen the extraordinarily low oil prices, which helps them, even so, it doesn't really pay to fly these flights without, um, without many passengers on board. So that is cutting seriously into air capacity. What we see here in Chicago, of course, uh, with uh, United Airlines has cut 85% of its international routes. And uh, I think that we have only one direct flight, uh, at least that was the case a couple of days ago, that may change now, uh, one direct international flight from the United States to an international designation is to Cancun. Um, uh, all other flights uh, from Chicago uh, have uh, two international des uh, uh, destinations have been canceled uh, mm -hmm. by United Airlines and American has done the same thing. So you see that the real impact, uh, none of which has to do with government policy uh, directly, but with uh, the reality that the last thing people want to do is get on an airplane these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's real. Let me, uh, let me uh, turn to some of the questions that, uh, that are uh, uh, being yeah. submitted online. And again, thank you for continuing to do so all of the, you uh, out there who are uh, listening and participating uh, in this way. Let me, uh, first question, uh, the, the one most popular is what, what steps a national government can take to stimulate growth right now? What is, if you were back in your old perch at the Council on Economic Advisors, uh, not focusing particularly on trade, but in general, what, uh, what advice would you have that uh, uh, Congress or, uh, or the administration uh, take now to, to really find a way to get growth uh, turned back on, or at least be ready for growth to be turned back on whenever it is possible uh, for us. Yeah. To, so. I think it's more be ready for growth than to have growth right now. I think I, I, I saw a range of estimates, and this range is moving week by week, but the ones that I've seen this week have ranged for, for second quarter GDP from a 3% shrinkage to, I think, a 14% shrinkage um, on an annual basis, just looking at the second quarter. Um, like I said, the, the things that looked crazy on the low side the week before, all of a sudden mark the high side the, the following week. Um, I think the government's doing a lot of the things that they can. I think it's keeping key channels open. Can you move goods? Can employees stay employed? Um, will there be enough demand to keep businesses going? Will businesses have the money to resume operations? We've seen very large sectors of the economy take a serious hit. If you think about the entire you just talked about United with the flights. 
but the, the entire sort of transportation, lodging, all of these. Um, there's real challenges on things like keeping ports open, uh, which is essential to do. You saw Houston's two main terminals shut for about a day earlier this week when you had an infection there and they were responding to it. So that's key. So keeping those, keeping those staffed, this is getting to be a key question for a lot of places now where they say everyone's supposed to stop working except for essential employees. There's some difficult decisions there about what are, who are essential employees. So I think that's the biggest thing is trying to figure out how you don't make things sort of freeze up and break in some irreparable fashion. Um, and that's the hope for a more U-shaped recovery is it lasts for a while, but everybody's sort of there to rebound. And when we all kind of come out of our quarantines, we're, we're able to go to a restaurant and, and you know, to a retail store and, and to buy things. Um, but, and that's, that's the, the proposals that people have been putting forward, such as cash for people with sort of low incomes who often aren't getting sick leave, for example, um, I think those are very reasonable proposals as, as ways to sort of weather the crisis and, and go directly at the kind of things that, that can cause lasting damage. How about the idea of, of, of getting enough money to, uh, to businesses, large and small, and deep gig economy workers, uh, to stay, uh, to, to continue to have a paycheck so that when the economic activity comes back up, you actually have in place uh, the infrastructure uh, to, for, rapid, for rapid recovery and rapid growth, as opposed to all these businesses that have to shut down where the, the workers are no longer paid and you, you, you multiply uh, the difficulty there. I mean, small business loans, but uh, well beyond that. Uh, yeah. any, any, is that, but, is that know, something we should be looking at? I, we should absolutely be looking at it. And we did have a package with small business loans go out. Um, the real challenge here is if we knew for a fact, this was say a four week problem, that we're going to do this for four weeks and then we're fine, freezing everything for four weeks with the, we'll just give, you know, we'll pay businesses so that the revenue doesn't go down as long as they keep their employees, we do things. You could think about some of that stuff. We're in a time of extraordinarily low interest rates. It's not terribly hard for the government to borrow at this stage. You have the Fed stepping in and helping. It gets harder as we extend longer. We're in a very dynamic economy. Things, things change a lot. So if you look right now, we're seeing a shift where it's often people are doing less of their shopping at retail stores and more online, for example. Well, sometimes, you know, this is sort of precipitating those trends um, that were happening anyways. It's, so the idea that you sort of lock a dynamic economy in place for four months, six months, eight months, that's a lot harder. And it also gets to be a lot of money that we're talking about and you get questions about, do you do that with strings attached? I think it's really problematic when you start talking about the government owning equity stakes in lots of businesses. Um, so as an idea, should we think about it? Yes, we absolutely should think about it. Um, it raises all kinds of challenges. You already started talking about uh, another question that, that, that comes from online, which is sort of what industries uh, are going to uh, possibly benefit from this? Oh, uh, how, how can we think there are always winners and losers in every economic situation. And, and in this one, uh, there, uh, there, there's going to be uh, some winners or some, some, some businesses and industries that are going to benefit, even though we know there are lots of them who are suffering. Uh, what are you seeing out there uh, about uh, in industrial sectors, what sectors, what industries, what businesses do you think uh, uh, might benefit from, from what's going on? I think two obvious ones that we're seeing in the very short term, home delivery. So Amazon is kind of hiring as fast as it can, trying to keep up with this because it feels safe and, and there's a source of supply when you can't normally go out and do things. So anybody who has that kind of an online ability to deliver that way. Um, and of course, then all the related industries that are actually carrying out that delivery. They've got a lot of challenges here. Are they keeping their workers safe? You know, Do they have workers who can do this? But that is a real opportunity. We're also, um, we're also seeing, and I'm going to try not to name company names, but you're, you're seeing companies like Exercise at Home. That Let's say you sell um, a, a fancy bike where on the screen in front you can uh, get exercise classes from remote. That's a very popular thing. Um, and we've seen it in the stock at least. They've done very, very well because it's, it's an opportunity for people to meet those needs, which otherwise they might have gone to a gym um, to meet. 
Yeah, and I, I guess uh, virtual communication platforms are uh, doing pretty well too. They uh, have been. So they've been trying, they've been passing this out. Yeah, virtual. So yes, the, the Zoom that we're on now, um, others, there's going to be some challenges for them performing, but absolutely, it's proof of concept and, and they may do very well with it. That's a good one. So I know you're not a financial advisor and you're not here to give financial advice to anyone, but everybody is very interested. Uh, you know, do you have any advice for, uh, for the average uh, citizen to think about what they should do on their financial, uh, to, uh, to deal with their financial situation? Uh, what, what steps might be possible for them to take uh, to protect them as much as possible against the downturn? Yeah, it's a very tricky financial time. We've seen equity markets, so the stock market, if you want to think of the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones, fall dramatically. And it's extraordinary. They, there's an index that actually comes out of Chicago that, that measures this, the VIX, so the volatility index. And it's hitting levels. This is part of your early question about what's comparable. It's hitting levels which have only been seen in October and November of 2008 that in terms of how much volatility there is, it's hitting numbers like 75 or 80. What that literally means is that options are pricing in either 75% moves up or down over the next year. So enormous moves, which we, which we don't normally see. So this huge volatility is very difficult. Um, I think it's a reminder that, uh, that you know, you, we, people should really be investing in equities with money that they intend for the long term, that there is volatility. We had gone through a quite a long bull market where it seemed like every dip was an opportunity to buy. I think now there's more of a thought of is this the right thing to do in, in the longer term? And if it if it really if you are invested for the longer term, then try not to look and see what happened each day with the Dow. Um, it'll just make you anxious. Um, and so, and if not, you're you're taking your chances. Um, there are opportunities. I think where I'm not going to make any picks, but you can look and see, are there companies here who have gotten sort of beaten down with everyone else, but look like they have fundamentally sound businesses? You're taking a bit of a gamble on how quickly do we recover from this? But if this turned out to be something where, you know, in three or four months, we were starting to normalize things, we all devoutly hope that's the case, not guaranteed. But if that's true, who's going to look good and who's going to look like they were cheap? Um, but but there is there is a high degree of risk to that. You're, uh, uh, you spent a lot of time in your last uh, uh, years on on trade policy, and of course in your current job following uh, supply chains uh, and shipments across the globe uh, in a whole variety of different ways. Uh, there's of course an immediate hit to trade uh, for that we already talked about, but. Uh, put on your 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 crystal ball, uh, your, your your thinking cap, your future future looking cap, your your Yogi Berra predicting prediction is difficult, especially about the future cap, right? Uh, and 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 what do you think the implication is for trade and the trading system over time of well, this of this crisis? Yeah, it's interesting. You've seen a couple different reactions. There's one. Uh, the Peter Navarro's of the world. This is uh, the protectionist trade advisor um, for uh, for President Trump, who says, "Aha! This proves it. You know, we never should have had globalization. We never should have been dependent." Um, I think that's the equivalent to saying that I should have had, you know, pigs and chickens in my backyard because I wouldn't have to worry about this grocery store run. I could have really been self sufficient here in California. I should have had a loom to to sew thread for you know for new things. That wasn't happening, that's not going to happen. Having that kind of self-sufficiency is really costly. I think I, I reached actually the opposite conclusion here, which is that we're seeing that we're interconnected for a reason, that often it's essential, whether you're talking about medical devices, parts, um, that the exact reason that we are able to produce things so efficiently and so well is because it is a global system operating together. Um, I think this is an argument we're going to have. I know which side I come down on. Um, I think it's going to be a vigorous argument coming out of this. So related to that is 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 uh, an argument we're not not yet having, but I think we're at the verge of having. The president has uh, has invoked the Defense Production Act, uh, a wartime act that allows the the president to direct industry to manufacture uh, products that are necessary for for the national for national security reasons. Uh, and that's how we uh, we we got companies to to take uh, the war seriously and to 
churn uh, out uh, uh, instead of Ford's uh, tanks and, and, and armor personnel carriers, et cetera. I think we're at the verge of uh, uh, having a problem in some very serious medical device uh, capabilities as, uh, as, as hospitals are running short, as we are seeing each and every day. And the federal government's stepping in and saying, we need to, need to do this. Um, the question uh, I, I have, uh, the, the, the capabilities are so, more, so, so, so much more sophisticated. Uh, the supply chains that interact to produce the kind of things that we're producing are so much more international. Can we even do what we did in World War II and turning the, the system around and saying, we're now all going to make uh, um, uh, respiratory uh, uh, things and masks and, and, and new uh, and new capabilities, and we're no longer churning out what we used to churn out. Is that a is that a feasible thing for us to be thinking about? Yeah, it is. And and you have companies volunteering. I think some of the auto companies have volunteered along these lines. Elon Musk with Tesla has has volunteered along these lines. Said we're capable to do it. Usually, the biggest holdup is can you get sort of regulatory approval that that they have factories that can do these things and do sophisticated um, production, will the FDA say, yes, you're fine, we approve these medical devices? Um, it's not a, and because of that, this is not a two week thing. This ends up being a three or four month thing. Um, but, it, but a lot of that is sort of an approval process. I think the thing to keep in mind, the reason we don't do this most of the time is we can do that, but we can do even more. We can make even more sophisticated things and then trade for the less sophisticated things. And so we end up having more overall, but we didn't lose the capacity to, to do these things. Um, and it, it, there isn't, now what is true is there is this adjustment time. Some of that's regulatory, some of this is just technical. I mean, the, the thing that you, you know, had the line that you had set up to make a Model S does not automatically become a line to make a ventilator. Um, it takes some adjustment, but the skill set is there. And, and so, uh, and the supply chain, the problem is not going to be as, particularly if trade and, and goods uh, are reduced, it's going to be less. There's, not, there's other, perhaps more expensive ways. Uh, yeah. but there are other ways to fill it out. That's right. And a little bit of it is, at some point you say, you know, forget efficiency. I just want these things. Right. You know, we could make iPhones in the, exclusively in the United States. The problem is they would cost thousands of dollars. They already do, but but well, yeah. more, more, <laughs> but even more, more yeah. many more thousands than they than they currently do, um, and it's because instead of making each part in the place that can make it cheapest, you try to do it all here. Um, but I think that's the situation we're in when you're talking about things like masks and ventilators right now, which is price isn't really an object, and so it's that rare instance where we say we we just don't care most of the time when we're not in a crisis like this. Price is a really big deal that you're much less likely to buy the $4,000 iPhone than the $800 iPhone. So we, we, we've talked a lot about sacrifice cost, uh, uh, the, the, the huge economic impact uh, of the crisis, and, and more importantly, of the steps that we have taken in order to address the, uh, the health crisis. Um, you're an economist. Uh, should we think about cost and benefit? And at what point is the cost of the measures that we've taken uh, too large? How do we think about that? Yeah, so that's a, it's a very good question and a difficult question. Yes, you know, it's, it's in the blood. One has to think about cost and benefit. Um, there's enormous benefit to taking action now. And I think that's why you haven't seen much hesitation, that, that the, uh, the benefit of avoiding a freeze-up, of avoiding a situation where you have to sort of rebuild an economy from scratch is enormous. And so that's why... So what's the cost of taking some of these dramatic actions? Um, I think, you know, one of the things is where's the money coming from? What are we doing? The tradition, we went into this having been fairly profligate. We, we were running very large budget deficits. We were not saving for a rainy day and now the rainy day is here. So what does that mean? Um, the concern would be that if you did an extraordinary amount of borrowing, and you had, say, the Fed finance this. Well, two concerns. One, if the government just goes out and borrows it, you worry that it's going to crowd out private industry. Um, two, you worry that if you get the Fed then stepping in and making sure that interest rates remain low and financing all of this, then you'll have too many dollars chasing too few goods, and the, the impact is going to be inflation. I think most people are looking at this and saying that cost is fairly remote. 
that it's, it's unlikely we're going to be facing that. We were seeing a little bit of inflation right before all of this started, but this is going to be heavily deflationary. So yes, you're doing a cost benefit analysis, but it, it weighs heavily towards taking fairly extreme measures um, in this instance. So let me, uh, at the close, uh, uh, I'll sort of ask the big, I think the, the really big question, and we, we already played around with it, which is the impact of, of this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, and the, the virus and everything that it means on the future of globalization. On, uh, you know, we've, we've gone through this incredible, rapid uh, economic and, 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 and political and, and any other kinds of uh, globalization. We've seen a backlash uh, a bit uh, already over the last three or four or five years uh, here in the United States, of course, but also in Europe. Uh, there was well before this crisis already talk of maybe we're entering a deglobalization period. You mentioned people like Peter Navarro and others uh, who are, are talking about returning to a to a self sufficient kind of market. Uh, how do you uh, how do you look at this? And if, if, if as you were thinking about where we're going to be, at some point we're going to get through this crisis. At some point we're going to find a vaccine and and deal with this disease. Uh, a lot of damage may be done in the in the process, uh, economic damage and and more importantly humanitarian damage. But at some point we're going to get through it, whether that's in you know five months or or or, or eighteen months or what what have you. Uh, we're going to get there. Yeah. How do you see? the future of the world at that, at that point? Where do you see the, the, the trend uh, going? Yeah, um, it is a big question. I think we can break it down into two parts, at least. So one is, what are we going to want to do? And two is, what are we going to be able to do when the time comes? So in terms of what we want to do, um, I think that as sort of clearer heads prevail, we're going to see the re we got substantial value out of being integrated uh, in the, in, into the global economy. Um, one of the things I think we've seen, you and the Chicago Council have been putting out uh, remarkable data with the survey that has shown this sort of steadily improve, even as we've attacked it, not through the uh, coronavirus, but through trade policy measures, you have measured a steadily increasing public support for trade. I have sometimes analogized that to the way medical science will discover, say, what different lobes of the brain does, where some very unfortunate person takes an arrow through one of them, and then you realize, ah, that was speech. Um, it, you're seeing something like that with trade, where we took it for granted. It was part of how things function. Your iPhone was delivered at a reasonable price, mostly reasonable. Um, and you know, this, you're going to see those, these, I think you could have these interruptions proving the case. And we, I hope and expect that we'll see a continuation of the kind of things you've been picking up in the survey of in, in, in a better attitude. Then there's a question of, all right, if we come around on this, is that option still on the table? And there I have some bigger concerns, which is that there's a decent amount of trust that underlies this, this interdependence and this sort of global trade. And I worry that that's been damaged. I, I look at things, the US certainly got out there first trying to shut down borders and attack trading partners. Um, and I'm talking about over the last several years, not particularly in this crisis. But then we are seeing in this crisis, things like within Europe, the attempt to restrict uh, exports of medical devices. If that trust gets undermined, we're going to have a lot of rebuilding to do to have a well-functioning system. We see institutions like the World Trade Organization that are under severe attack right now. Um, if those things get damaged on a global scale, we're going to have serious rebuilding to do. Phil, as always, uh, your insights are, are greatly appreciated. You're, you have this rare talent of talk about uh, uh, important, but also uh, technically uh, sophisticated ways in a language that lay people like me understand. Uh, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you join us for this conversation. Uh, we'll hope to have you back soon. Uh, as the situation evolves, no doubt we're, we're going to be talking about these issues for a while. Um, be safe uh, uh, out there in, in San Francisco uh, and uh, be well. And for all of you who uh, tune in today, uh, wonderful to have you uh, join us. The, the Chicago Council is virtually intact, uh, meaning we are intact in the virtual way. Uh, we want to have you uh, join us uh, each and every day when we uh, go out and do these programs and have these kinds of discussions. And, uh, and, and thank you for uh, joining us and uh, for your support of an organization like ours. 
uh, with that, uh, it's Godspeed to all, and thank you for joining me again, uh, Phil. Uh, all the best, and for everyone, stay safe and stay healthy.